Texas, 1867. This is the true story of 15 brave men and women who traveled back in time, daring to live as the early cowboys and ranchers did over 130 years ago. These modern day adventurers will endure two and a half months of heat and hardship, a test of true grit. But do they have what it takes to succeed on Texas Ranch House? Funding for Texas Ranch House is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Uh, it's the morning of July 5th. Well, the July. <laughs> In the bunkhouse, the cowboys shake off their hangovers. Over at the ranch house, the Cook family struggles to get out of bed. You ready to get up? <laughs> As the cowboys begin their day, Ian and Sean make a startling discovery. None of the gates were open or anything like that. 10 of their 19 horses are gone. I think we better look for some tracks around here. Yeah, I think we've been rustling. I think we have been. Horse rustling. It looks like the work of experienced rustlers. They've taken some of the best horses in the Ramuda. How many? Just gone. Yeah, I just think somebody came in. I knew, I, I thought though, I heard horses going last night, but I thought they were just fighting over here like they always do. It's all right, it's all right, it's a good challenge. First thing we do in the morning is go out and water the garden, because it's a, probably an hour and a half job to get enough water on that garden to keep it from drying up with this hot weather we've been having. My middle daughter, Lacey, comes running over. She says, Dad, um, all the horses are gone. So we mean all the horses are gone. They told me to tell you that all the horses are gone except for a couple. How many horses do we have? Um, I would say less than 10. That's not all the horses, OK. Is everybody going to go out? I don't know. It's over now. First thing that crossed my mind was, why the heck didn't somebody tell me this sooner? And why wasn't a cowboy knocking on my door or chasing me down to tell me that there was a problem with livestock. That's a big deal on the ranch. Without horses, we can't ranch. The situation is critical, and the cowboys should leave immediately. Instead, they stop for breakfast, still trying to recover from the night before. We're worn out from last night, and we just want something good to give us the energy to, to get going. So this is our breakfast for the day. And that's how much we get. I'm not really sure what it is. It doesn't taste very great. But uh, that's it. Good hearty meal. Hey, Robbie, yes, sir. you want a halter for every stolen horse? With every passing minute, the chances of finding the horses and the rustlers grow smaller. Let's go, guys. You knew about this an hour ago. Post-Civil War Texas was notorious for its lawlessness and horse rustling was a constant problem for ranchers. Though our cowboys don't carry guns, an 1867 ranch would have been well equipped with sidearms and rifles. The Texas Rangers were not reestablished until 1874, and there was only one court based in San Antonio to serve the entire West Texas frontier. So rustlers usually met their fate at the hands of ranchers vigilante justice. If they weren't shot dead on the spot, the punishment was death by hanging.
As the cowboys search for the stolen horses, the women of the Cook Ranch are stuck at home, doing chores, as usual. They're becoming frustrated with the male-dominated culture of 19th century Texas. I was feeling very optimistic I would have this done by lunch. That's not going to happen. I have goals just like everybody else does as to what they'd like to see at the end. Let me go get the girls to come over and help you. OK, if they're done eating. But in dealings with the cowboys, it hadn't occurred to them that we had, as women, something in mind, or that I would have something in mind that I was looking for out here. The pile's not supposed to get bigger. It's supposed to get smaller. I'm sorry, I have dirty clothes. Why is this yellow? Oh. Don't eat my skirt. <laughs> get a little frisky. Careful, I'm not ready for our relationship to progress <laughs> to this level yet. <laughs> I think he's convinced that you have an udder somewhere. I have none. I'm almost kind of jealous of like the cowboys or the foreman because they know what they're supposed to do and I don't always know what I'm supposed to do. Jeez. Okay, you are just causing problems. Like at home, my goal in life is get through college, you know, become my own person and out here it's like, I'm just one of the daughters. I'm one of the three sisters. I'm, I'm just one of the girls that sits in the background or, you know, whatever. I want to say that I got this through this whole thing, but it feels like forever, <laughs> especially when the days feel really long. OK, tilt it again. I mean, it's just, it drags. Oh. So hopefully I'll get through it. <laughs> it's been hard to be at the house so much with four other women and not losing my mind or, you know, us beating each other to death. I mean, we're, we're women. We're going to go at each other, you know? But I rely a lot more on social interaction. I need that balance of guys and girls. And that's why I'm, you know, more eager to do something different than just sit here and wait for the men, even if that's more historically accurate. I am the youngest one out of everybody. And sometimes it feels kind of isolated. You feel alone, left out a lot. So I try to you know, do something to kind of keep my day busy. But I have Howie. You're a big boy. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. In addition to their regular chores, the women have a new problem to deal with. We are being invaded by flies. They have taken over our house. It's pretty nauseating. <laughs> By not moving the animal manure far enough away from the ranch, flies are becoming a big problem. Good. <laughs> just don't ever go away. It has been a war, <laughs> and I am determined to win. It's really gross. Out on the range, the cowboys are having no luck finding the missing horses. Despite the Hollywood myth of the cowboy and his horse, Texas cowhands typically had a string of seven to 10 horses so that each horse had a few days rest after a work day. Our cowboys work shorter days and for now can get by with a smaller remuda. But they will need all their horses for the cattle drive when they'll be spending long days in the saddle. Without enough horses, the future of the Cook Ranch is in jeopardy. The cowboys return to the ranch empty-handed. And Anders collapses straight into bed. He's the latest victim of the mysterious stomach bug that has been plaguing the bunkhouse. Nacho's food is the prime suspect. With Nacho's cooking, it's just kind of filthy. Like, like the stuff we ate like two days ago and stuff from the same bin, just being heated and, you know, reheated and reheated, you know? Nacho's food looks suspicious in any way. You go hungry. <laughs> just about all of us have had, you know, the runs. We've had diarrhea off and on. Should we had one of our guys kind of got a little sick. Uh, he had some, oh, there's a food or something like that. He had kind of some stomach deal going on, but I've lost about 15 to 20 pounds here lately. 
I think uh, a lot of these guys have 2005 notion of what food should be, and this is not a culinary environment. This is a survival environment, so here comes the win. This is what I have to contend with. So you wipe down, and then 10 minutes later, you got this dust bowl. The threat of dirt and dust was ever present in the bunkhouse kitchen. Known as the cook's fire, it was off limits to the cowboys. Hey, Nacho. Can I have a second with you? With another cowboy ailing, Mr. Cook decides he needs to talk to Nacho about his cooking. I had a number of performance concerns about him, but he was unable to execute the simple process of putting a simple meal on the table, and after the meal, making sure that the uh, utensils and the, the tools and the pots were clean and sterile so that the next time they got used, nobody would get sick. Uh, I just wanted to talk about kind of how it's going with the cooking side of things. Very concerned about the health part of, you know, the health and safety part of the thing. And, and I've got to see that improved. Doing the best I can. I mean, I got sick and it, I don't think it was the food. So. I, I'm not qualified to assess what it was that yeah. affected them, but, but it, it, it points to something about the food or the preparation or the cleaning. This so, is the deal that oh, we let have. Me finish, let me finish, Nacho. They get up at seven. Nacho, let me finish, please. Yeah. I am officially putting you on notice that, that if I don't see it turn around in the next few days. If you want miracles, then I'm not the miracle man. No. It is incredibly difficult to work with the food Pick up pots and pans and stay clean. Well, I, I want my shack is I a want, shambles. I, First I of all, want, that's the other thing. I need help well, in organize. I don't have a I don't have a door. I don't have a wall on my shack. I'm living in a lean to. I have rocks for a floor. I breathe dust in every day. He's the kind of guy who dominates conversations and has a very difficult time stopping, closing his mouth and listening to what other people have to say and actually processing it. They should be respecting my kitchen. And in old days, in old days, if you go back to old kitchens and, and, and ranch cooks or a cookie, he would have slammed you upside your head with a frying pan and you would have not said He was why. basically the one getting things off his chest. I was just listening to what he had to offer and giving him my opinion about how I felt. I don't need unnecessary criticism for a job that's very difficult to begin with. All right. Well, you know. we'll make it better one step at a time. Yeah, yeah and it yeah, is. That's, that's, that's how you do it. He responded as if it was all about whatever. I'm convinced that a lot of what I told him, he didn't process. Ranch cooks who worked in terrible conditions often develop reputations for being ornery. One cook beat his boss with his frying pan and coffee pot after a complaint about his food and still managed to keep his job. All right, I want to make something clear. Anything dealing with the kitchen, I want no one to touch it. And in the cook shack, it's off limit unless I know that you're going in there. You take anything out of there without permission, you're stealing. That's the end of the story. Mrs. Cook, who listened in on the meeting, shares her thoughts. You know he lies to you, right? Of course I do. I absolutely know he lies to you. He said that. We didn't want anybody lying to us here. OK. I've given him his warning. Does he know it was a warning? Yeah. OK. I didn't get to hear the whole thing. Well, so he knows scared. it's a warning. What seriously concerns me, concerns me about him not acknowledging he got those boys sick more than once is that you can't fix anything that you won't admit you're doing. He's an adult. I'm not going to change his, his behavior. That's why sometimes people have to I can change his performance, but I can't change his behavior. If he doesn't perform better, then adios, amigo. Fair enough. My dad is in the worst position of all of us, I think. I, mean, I think he's having the hardest time. Because we all look to him to make the decisions and to get things done. It's just so much pressure. And I mean, he's really doing the best he can. And I think he's doing a good job. I think um, it's been a big learning experience for him. <laughs> The next day, the cowboys head off in a new direction in search of their stolen horses. Mr. Cook has decided to join them. Well, we can it's do something. They're down there because there's only one way out. Huh? It's good if they're down there. Can just push them. 
I mean, for real, they can just take off that. Suddenly, Jared sees something in the distance. We got him now. In a stroke of luck, the cowboys find five of their horses. The rustlers themselves are nowhere to be seen. We got some of the horses back, so that's good. Worked out pretty good, sir. I thought you wanted them in there. Yes, but if you're right there, you're going to push them to left or right. You need to be up here where you can push them to the gate. They're not out of the woods yet. Despite the cowboy's successful day, the ranch is still down five horses, animals critical to the upcoming cattle drive. See how we got. In the evenings, with only each other for company, cowboys had to create their own entertainment. The ranch hands use every minute to polish their ranching skills. <laughs> New distance. A cowboy's lariat comes from the Spanish word lariata, oh. meaning rope. It was often made of braided rawhide, which gave it both weight and pliability. Ah. Hannah joins in the fun. Footfall. And gets a few pointers. I think that's game, man. That is game. Good competition. There's homemade entertainment at bedtime, too, thanks to a frog that's wandered in through an open door in the ranch house. Oh, hello. I'll turn to a prince. He said, well. Where are you? <laughs> Toothpaste wasn't readily available on the range, so many ranchers used homemade tooth powder made of chalk to clean their teeth, if they cleaned them at all. Anything from a rag to a twig could serve as a toothbrush. I'm not a lady. Thanks a lot. Mr. Cook has decided to give his daughters a break from their chores and take them on a ride. Myself and Hannah and my mom and dad are gonna go riding. Um, little ride, we haven't gotten to go out much. We literally are like chained to our house. We don't get to go anywhere. They're borrowing the cowboy saddles, which doesn't sit well with the crew. I, don't, I mean, I don't mind them riding, because I mean, I think they should, because I mean, it'd be pretty boring just to stay here, you know? But I don't think it should do it during the working day, you know? He always wants to be able to be real productive. And when he wants to get the girls out for leisure rides, you know, in the morning like this, he pretty much hinders everything. But at the same time, he's the owner, so you can't really say anything against it, you know? Obey orders. You know, people are always saying the grass is always greener, and we always were so jealous that they get to go riding, and they're jealous that we have leisure time. Well, now it's switching. We get to go riding, and they have leisure time, so. Having lost two days to the search for horses, the cowboys are way behind in the hunt for cattle. They've only rounded up 12 cows so far, a fraction of what they need, and their frustration is showing. When they ride, they, they occupy a lot of saddles. This is a working ranch. It's not a dude ranch. And the horses are needed early in the morning. These cowboys need to get out and ride. But it's not just the time lost cow hunting that has upset the cowboys. In 1867, a cowboy's saddle was his most valuable possession. It belonged to him, not the ranch owner. So critical was it to his livelihood that the phrase, he sold his saddle, came to mean a cowboy's riding days were over. They came to us and they're telling us that the saddles were theirs. I did mention to them that any place that I've been, you always take your own saddle. 
and that and your saddle is your saddle. Nobody's allowed to touch it unless you give a permission. And no matter if it's your ranch, you steal my saddle is my saddle, and you don't touch it. I think Robbie did not want to uh, feel like he was being sidelined, when in reality, the plan was he was going to stay and, and shoe horses working with Anders on that, because they're the only guys that know how to shoe horses here, too. We need them for that. But there's not enough equipment around here to have individual pieces of equipment for the, the family members. So uh, the boys are just going to have to get over it. We're going to use the equipment. It's a great day for riding. Finally. Uh. <laughs> Dad, hmm? the whole deal about borrowing saddles, what was the deal with that? Nothing. Thanks. Cowboys, cowboys are very, get very attached to their personal items because they don't have that many things, but their saddles are very personal to them. Sometimes they don't like people messing with them. It's kind of like that. So I guess Nacho thinks he's a cowboy then. Well, I don't know about Nacho. He's not a cowboy. Come on, Let's go, you guys. Ladies in the 1800s would only have ridden side saddle, and the Cook Ranch is equipped with two. Mom, can you go faster? Though riding side saddle is a difficult skill to master, a ranch woman was doomed to virtual immobility without it. The Cook women feel safer riding astride. I know a lot of the guys don't think that our rides are worth anything. They think they're more for joy rides. But I have to disagree with that because being out here is a chance in a lifetime. Okay, whoa up here, guys. In 1867, the branch owner would have taken their fam his family out and shown them the land because eventually one of his like sons or daughters would have inherited the branch. This is all part of our ranch. Way over there. Way over there. Dude. Going through here is too rough. We're not going to go through that. We're going to go around that way. Turn right, Hannah. When we get it, we're going to end up over there on that mini mesa thing. This is a little slippery here, guys. Be, keep just keep your feet up. down. Are we heading down? Good boy. Following the outing with his family, Mr. Cook decides it's time to review his bookkeeping. He discovers he's made a critical mistake. Rather than needing 85 cattle, he actually needs 200 in order to have enough cows to sell and enough left over to restock his ranch. We'll just ride, find the cattle, and give it a couple days, see what's happening, and then it's going to be kind of an adjustment, you know? The news puts the cowboys under serious pressure. They only have about six weeks left to round up 188 head. The next day, the cowboys are off in hot pursuit of Maverick Longhorn. Foreman Robbie finds a new set of tracks. His father is a rancher, and Robbie grew up in the saddle. Mainly my dad, he's the one that taught me how to work with cattle. I always uh, look down at the ground and look for fresh signs. Look at, uh, look at the day before, we did it rain, it was it windy, was it, what was the difference between yesterday and today? They could kind of let you know what, if the tracks are new. The tracks lead the cowboys to a herd of cattle hidden in a ravine. Slam! Robbie is a modern day vaquero, a Spanish word for cowboy that was eventually anglicized into buckaroo. Robbie, he's the man. Robbie has very much earned every cowboy's respect out here. He has a lifetime experience of cowboy work, horse work, roping, uh, and he's done the real deal.
Finally, after days of frustration, the Cowboys have something to show for their hard work. Today we brought in 48 cattle. Out of those 48, 36 of them were brand new, which is really good and exciting. Actually, we're gonna do the, pro the proper way. We're about to go process them now, so uh, the fruits of our labor are about to be claimed so we can uh, turn them out and do it all over again. <laughs> Push it. Get in the one step. Push it in. This one's a little bit more. You ready? With every bob tail, they're one step closer to building the herd of 200 cattle Mr. Cook needs to make his ranch a success. You got everything on your side? All right, let's roll Frank, out. Clear. Shh, shh. All right, get them going. With all the cows accounted for, they are set free to graze until the roundup and the cattle drive. The final tally now puts Mr. Cook's herd at 48. There you go, sir. Thank you. I'm really optimistic that we're going to be hitting it on all of our cylinders and, and, and going forward and, and really getting something fun done here and something that we can be proud of. To celebrate the day's success and help ease lingering tensions after the saddle incident, the Cowboys invite the Cook family to come and enjoy an evening of theater. Okay. Ian and Johnny have decided to perform a send-up of a martial arts film, 1867 style. Give me the cue. Power, you disgrace my family. No, it's time to die. You die like the pig you are. Crazy Power, you will die like the disgrace of your family. Yeah. Oh, you made my stick. There's been a lot of laughter around camp. And that excites me because laughter is the outward manifestation of something much deeper. Joy and contentedness and optimism. And all of those things are very important to the overall success of this ranch. Thank you very much. We'll be here a week. Guess we can take the same route we took yesterday. The next day, it's back to business for the Cowboys. Even with yesterday's roundup, the pressure remains to increase the herd. After days on end of 110 degree heat, a storm provides welcome relief. Come on, guys. Come on. Turn around the house. Caught out on the open range with no cover, the cowboys are in danger of being struck by lightning. But they soon return safe, though soaked and with no cap. Are the other guys coming? Yeah, they're coming in tubes. Oh, there's uh, Robbie. Yep, right there for a ride, huh? Getting clearer that way, so it probably won't be a really long one. 
By evening, the ranch hands are hungry, but there's no meal prepared. I heard some strange noises coming from the pig pen, and I was like, what could that be? The piggies, it's time to eat. Free, free, free. Oh my gosh. Free, free, free. Johnny, what are you doing? I'm eating pig trough food now. Because as I see it, the only animals that are getting fat in this farm are the pigs. The other day I was told that uh, if I didn't like the cooking, I should go ahead and cook myself. So I came out here and I built this fire and I started those potatoes and I cut those squash. But the potatoes are being cooked wrong. The squash is cut the wrong size. And over here, the meatballs are done too large. So, He's as a result, the master. He's the master. He's the master. As a result, of caca. Nacho, of caca. As he's letting you know now, kicked me out of the kitchen because, because he... I don't know how to cook, well, which I don't. He's a I don't. Here's the story tonight. <laughs> we came back from the ride, and Nacho said, "I think I'll start a fire in 30 or 40 minutes and begin dinner." We were all hungry. And then it turned to dinner was going to be rawhide. Better eat some rawhide was the, the statement he said. Yeah, so. So I went over there, started a fire, and began preparing dinner. You want to be the cookie, then you can be the cookie uh, seven days a week, and then I'll ride. And I won't fall off my horse. Huh. Ooh, that was right. Three times. Ooh, my kettle. That, that really be a little bit. All right, buckaroo. If the excuses were meals, we'd all be fat people right now. Oh, I would love that. I How many kitchens have that. you worked in? I don't care. I went How in many kitchens vegetables. have you worked in? I went in there. How done. many professional yeah. kitchens have you worked in? Yeah. None. Zero. Are you going to ask me the question or are you just going to talk story. over me? And the story. Are you going to ask me a question and then talk over me? You're a politician. Me? You'll write a speech and then you'll give us a whole speech We're gonna eat for three wrong, minutes. Don't ask but questions you don't want answers to. There's a tip. Feeling unappreciated by everyone, Nacho blames Mr. and Mrs. Cook for giving him inadequate supplies. You see this rotten onion? This is called sharing. This is the kind of sharing that we get a red onion from the Cook family. Mr. Cook comes and gives us this speech about the honesty, and I will not tolerate uh, anyone that is not honest and uh, sincerity and all of this stuff. But I know one thing. I know that they are full of it. Look at this place. This was built by the hand of all these cowboys here. You, you, you insult us by saying that you're being fair with me and you're being fair with the boys. My guys, and I'm the cookie, my guys are starving half the time, okay? But don't come to me with your self-righteousness and your self-righteousness indignation, you know? Because if this was a real ranch, we would have all left a long time ago. And you can ask any of these boys, they wouldn't have left a long time ago, okay? So get real. We know who runs the house over there, and it ain't you, mister, and it ain't you, and you know that. Bring it on, baby. Bring it, bring it. Bring the funk. Bring the funk, baby. Overhearing Nacho's rant, Mr. Cook makes a decision. The bunkhouse and the ranch house are not that close together. But when I heard him ranting and raving negative things against my family, that was it. Can you and me take a walk? Uh, I got a lot of cleaning to do. Can you and me take a walk? Yeah, right here. Why don't we just stop right here? Come on. Let me just clean this up first. Come with me, please. Remember a couple days ago when we walked up to the water fountain? And, uh, some of my expectations of how I wanted to see things happen right. in terms of your shop. Right. I'm accepting your resignation right now. I'm not, I'm not resigning. I didn't offer to resign, and I'm not resigning. Nacho, I remain gravely concerned about the health and safety issues of the sanitary conditions here. You want to and look you at have the not, sanitary, sanitary I, conditions? Uh, doesn't matter what you have to say right now. You're being fired right now, Nacho. You can hear the rest, or we can just call it now. You've skipped providing meals. When did I skip providing meals? Paramount to this decision is you've absolutely violated the rules I laid out when I first came down here which, to show respect to my family. I have shown respect to your family. You, you're lying to me now, which was another one of my firing rules. If you uh, lie, and you're you gone. you guys have lied to us. So here's what's going to happen. You're leaving tonight. Whatever. I want you to pack up your stuff, your personal items. I have fired you. You're done. The nacho thing happened. I'm not the person in charge here. If it had been me, I'd have done things a little bit different, but I guess 
things happen for a reason. Work, nice working with you. Hey, man, thanks again, guys. Yeah, man. You know, don't let that pussy run your life. He's a chump. His wife runs his whole life. Take care. There's no secret on the ranch that me and Nacho did not get along all the time. But the way he left really left a sour taste in my mouth. And to be honest with you, I was quite disappointed to see him go. Take that home back to California with you. Wish you the best, sir. Don't wish me anything. Learn about your men, feed them. Stop I intend to. Don't let your wife run your life. Safe travels. The Cowboys prepare to pitch in and take over Nacho's duties. We're probably going to start ending up doing some of the cooking ourselves. I don't see much of a problem with it. I'm sure it would be good to find us a cook, but if we don't, we can all pitch in and have, make a good meal every day. As the Cowboys ride out, Sean is left behind to clean up and organize the food supplies. I'm probably the most familiar with Nacho's Kitchen because, you know, I've been helping him out here and there. So I'll stick around the place and uh, team up with the ladies and go through what Nacho has left and see if we have any food over here to be able to do any cooking with. And uh, just in general, try to put this place back together and turn it into a kitchen again. Sean? Hi there. Hi. The women come over to help Sean set up the bunkhouse kitchen. I have no idea. It's just scary. You just poured down my shit. I didn't know there was something on it. Ew, it's ghost. Oh, it's old. Oh, oh, oh my gosh. Will you take it out and dump it? <laughs> like, really far away. <laughs> really, really. Their cleanup reveals how badly Nacho had neglected kitchen hygiene. That needs to go. I need to keep all of you alive and healthy, though, so that you can do the dishes. It smells like something died in here. <laughs> Nacho's poor kitchen management has also resulted in a lot of food being wasted. I don't know if I can go in a slot bucket or pigs like that or... If you dump things, that's, that's I want you to walk up past the rock ridge. The bunkhouse supplies are seriously low. <coughs> These are spices, that's cinnamon. Mr. Cook decides to consolidate the bulk of the provisions in the ranch house kitchen. Okay, we have to run down the ditches. You ready? The Cook family will provide meals for the ranch hands until a new solution can be found. Our family is going to make breakfast and dinner for them, and they're going to make their own lunches. And um, we are just going to make everything much more sanitary and better food and just make sure they're getting enough to eat. They're not going to miss any more meals anymore. And. Um, just hopefully get them fed, get them, get their health back up and not get sick anymore. Now that the Cook family controls all the food supplies, the cowboys are unhappy that they have to depend on them for their meals. Don't be shy, Sean's gonna get it all. The kids are tired. Could you see it? We're working here under the conditions that we get stuck three squares a day. Pretty awful. Did you all eat yet? And when they fired Nacho, they had to provide it themselves, you know? And I think all of us at the same time, we felt like we were guests at their house. We were really hoping that in inviting them over to eat with us and us making them meals, um, that they would really appreciate it and, you know, that we would just get closer as a group, but maybe they're just not their best at meals. <laughs> it was really difficult to have that group come and sit down at our table in our home. And I think to us, there actually felt that there was tension. We knew they were hungry. We knew the quality was good. So, you combine that with the attitude, it just feels like a lack of respect. The guys, they weren't feeling comfortable with the situation. And then uh, I heard people just say uh, that they were doing us a favor by feeding us. 
And I mean, I'd rather go hungry than have somebody throw that in my face. Historically, a rancher would have searched for a new cook at the nearest ranch or town. Luckily, Sean has volunteered to take on the job, assuming no one else is interested. In the spirit of uh, keeping change moving along here, since we seem to be enduring change all the time, um, <clears throat> yesterday I told you all that uh, anybody who's interested in applying for the, the cook for the, for the cook ranch, I just wondered um, if anybody here had thought about that, cared to put their name in. No, sir. All right. I'd rather no. <laughs> How about you, Anders? <laughs> no. Good. Good decision. Oh. Well, given that, since we don't have a lot of time to wait for somebody three months from now, I've decided to let Sean uh, take over the duties uh, as soon as we can get some food for him to cook, which will be a few days. And the opportunity to take on a new challenge and get a change of scenery, do something a little different, was just uh, too you know, big an opportunity to resist. Once he takes over the cooking, you'll be down one guy, and um, Robbie and I will work out whether or not we need to bring somebody in right away, or maybe just for the drive, maybe, maybe for the roundup on the drive. In the meantime, we'll take care of things up here. Well, thank you, ladies. Sean has no professional experience, and by 1867 standards, he's young for a cook. Usually, older cowboys, whose riding days were over, took to cooking as a way to continue living on the range. Sean, I don't know. I mean, I feel like, in a way, he sold out on us, just because he knew that two cowboys were gone, and we were hurting, and we were down to six, and now we're down to an odd number of guys. We can only split up into two groups instead of three now when we go look for cattle. And if someone gets hurt out of us or gets sick, like we all have been, you know, we're down to one group. This is a hard thing to do. Every day. Is there more coffee? <sighs> it was announced that um, Sean's going to take the job, take the responsibility to be the new cookie over at the bunkhouse. He has graciously asked for some tips from us. So, um, and they've graciously agreed. <laughs> and um, so for that. probably the next week or so until we get more supplies, because right now we're really low, um, he's going to come over for like the dinner meals at least and just watch us cook, learn the different dishes and stuff. Perfect. Two unannounced visitors approach the Cook Ranch, horses in tow. Good afternoon, ma'am. Howdy. Right. Welcome to the Cook Ranch. Thank you. Oh, look at these lovelies. Got a few <laughs> horses here. We'd like to trade. If y'all got anything to trade. Wonderful. Okay, if you no. guys would like to have a seat, maybe have a cup of coffee while you wait. Thank you. Appreciate okay. it. Okay. Maura, can you help? Thank you. Howdy, how are you, sir? How are you, sir? Howdy. 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 George Paul. George Paul? George. Yes, Timmy Brooks. George Timmy Brooks? Lisa Bill Cook. Cook. Nice to meet you. What brings you fellas by? Just passing through, trying to trade a few horses. Trying to trade some horses, huh? Yeah, we've got two nice, sound, good cow ponies there, and one little green broke stud coat there. Cool, big. The arrival of horse traders, not a common sight in 1867, is a welcome event. Quit. Still five horses short after being rustled, Mr. Cook needs additional horses for the cattle drive. So he asks his crew to pick out the best horse for sale. What's the plan, boys? Well, we're going to ride on down the road and work this horse. Y'all welcome to come down there yeah, and Yeah, we want to do that. Whatever. OK. Rodeo star and Brockbuster Timmy Brooks invites the ranch to watch as he breaks their new horse. The Cook family and cowboys set off to the pasture to watch Timmy at work. What a pleasant day. What a pleasant day waiting for the sun to shine.
Bronc busting often attracted freemen and former slaves because it offered a salary and status they could find in few other places. Although African Americans made up a quarter of all cowboys in the late 19th century, they faced extreme prejudice. It was loose. Uh, Whoa. Come here. Come here. I got him. Breaking a horse could take up to a month's time and was physically brutal and dangerous work. Few were willing to take it on. Go with him, I'll go with him. But having this specialized skill gave African American Brockbusters greater opportunities on the frontier. With another horse in the remuda, the ranch turns its attention to collecting firewood, a constant chore. In 1867, the ranch wagon was the equivalent of today's SUV, an all-purpose vehicle used for both hauling and transportation. It is vital to the ranch. Anders and, and Johnny and my daughter Lacey had gone out and gathered some firewood in the wagon. The wagon just pulled up. This is a good wagon. Oh, and they've got firewood. Hey, Hannah. It wasn't really that dark yet, but it was getting darker. Come on, baby girl. Ooh, ooh. How's your horse doing? Is ooh. it settling down? She's half crazy still. Half crazy ooh. still. We went out uh, with the wagon uh, to go out and get some firewood. We came back here. Uh, we stopped uh, and talked to Mr. Cook, see if somebody could hold the horse. Yeah, if we get one of the girls to hold it, her older, we'll like hold the reins or hold the front Hold the horse. halter. Hold the halter. Do you mind? Whoa, okay. Thank you. And I started got off the wagon. I turned around. And I'll, if I feel this thing hitting my leg, and I look around, I see the horse just. No. Ah, it's my foot right there. That's why you should hold it. I was trying to get right there. Yeah, something, something must have spooked her. The horse took off running. Oh, jeez. Oh, my just... God. Who's, are any of the guys over there? Yeah. Yeah, they're over there. The horse took, the horse took off. Took off. He let go of the reins. She didn't it have a hold like of his he head yet. The goat and hand. It was over. As Anders got off, I think he passed. Actually, we're quite unsure what happened. I think he passed the reins to Mr. Cook, who then tried to pass them to Mora. Anyway, I was taking a piece of firewood, and suddenly this horse just started bolting. But we need to check her over. The horse is unhurt, but the wagon is broken beyond repair. Gathering and collecting wood will be a much harder job as will carting away the ranch's manure. At least nobody got hurt. Did it run right over your leg, Johnny? Pretty much. Yeah, it's a light or something. Yeah. Horse brakes again. I want you guys out of the way. No, I don't think well. Please come here, Means. Come no, over I here. think she's fine. What? Don't mess with me. I wasn't messing with you. I can be right next to them. Okay? You'll do what I tell you to do. This horse is 1,500 pounds of craziness. I, I don't understand. want you standing in the way of it. I'm not trying to stand in the way of it. Then I'm... would you step aside, please, too? Fine. Thank you. You know about the wheels? You just have to trust me, and you don't. OK. Never a dull moment. In addition to the wagon, last night's greatest casualty may be relations between the sexes. It's been very eye-opening for me. I mean, I thought that you could come out here and, like, 
make a happy life as a woman, just like doing the domestic stuff. But it's really hard to, I mean, even though like you know me, like I have no interest normally in the horses and animals and stuff like that. But out here, it's like, that looks exciting. That looks different. That looks like an adventure. And I'm not on an adventure at all. Well, it's also interesting because all of the guys are so diverse and they come from different places mm -hmm. and different experiences mm -hmm. and they all Intriguing. inherently are sexist bastards, yeah. every single one of them. Mm -hmm. And they all love it mm -hmm. and they embrace it. Mm -hmm. And it took them like five minutes yeah. to put on that jacket. <laughs> like even my dad's a little chauvinistic. And what it brought out last night was that, you know what, I think I don't like being <laughs> yelled at and every man around here has an opinion about what we women should and should not be doing. And they aren't even necessarily that interested in hearing what we think with our own intelligence. The Cook family and the ranch hands gather to eat and new frictions become apparent. Out here, my management style has become more of a um, male-dominated type of uh, uh, leadership style, much to the chagrin of my family and my wife particularly. And it was very difficult because it changed the way my wife and I interact now, uh, is if I've had to take over and be the sole leader in, in terms of giving guidance to the, all the employees of the ranch. Robbie wants to discuss the dwindling food supplies and what will be purchased from the forthcoming merchant delivery. His concern is that Mrs. Cook has not ordered enough staples for his men. Do you know how much uh, flour we'll be getting? Because we are going through a lot of flour. We're going to get all the flour we can get off that wagon, and, and we'll order a ton more. Because, yeah, I mean, we are, well, we're six now. That's, that's And critical. when you're out there, we, we need a lot of, because my guys are, today, they're being weak and... Yep, so that's I mean, critical. I just want my guys to feel better, to feel have a full stomach. Because I've had like three of them that were kind of sick and, I mean, mal from malnourishment. That I want them to get better. Because I mean, I know I know what I can go through on an empty stomach, but I don't know what they can go through. But Robbie's concern for his men is taken as an insult by Mrs. Cook. We've done nothing but open our kitchen, double the food when you ask for more, go over there and clean your kitchen. What more do we have to do to earn the respect to be allowed to do our job one time before he criticizes it and says he has to stand over us? You're right. You're absolutely right. Um, oh, but I'm a bitch for saying it. No, you're not. You're just willing to confront. I am not going to be walked on. He's walking. He's trying to walk on me. And I tell you, you'll be humiliated if I have to go at this with him in public because you won't. All right. I see my family feeding off of each other in negativity. You know, it kind of festers. And you see it just kind of, they sit there dwelling on it, and it only gets worse because everyone's dwelling on it and everyone's feeding off of each other. I don't freaking care if he likes you. I don't either. For me. But then why are you pacifying him, saying, because taking has, his viewpoint with me? He has me? a lot of influence over those guys, and... Yeah, and right now, it's 100% negative. Myself. Doesn't it burn in you a little bit? Yes. I don't know if it's stubborn personalities on either side of the camp, or just different culture, or... I don't know. There's still kind of a, a gap between us. I've told you where I stand, and I need you to back me up, not I, him. I will. I'm not on his side. Uh, there was just a million different things going wrong. Uh, we were running out of food. Uh, we were having to be rationed. Uh, so tempers were running a little high. Uh, tensions were running high. I don't know how I'm going to deal with this, because right now I don't want to be here. Things here are just kind of beginning to suck, to be quite honest. I came out here to learn to be a cowboy and to learn to ride and rope and live the hard life and 